pleasant to dwell together in unity. Amen. This will be our 77th exposition of the book of Genesis. We're drawing to a close of it. It's been a very excellent uh, trip for me. We're going to be in the 48th chapter, verses 20, a uh, 47th chapter, verse 27, through the 8th chapter in verse 7. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew, and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years, so the whole age of Jacob was a hundred forty and seven years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself on the bed's head. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon a bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me in laws in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thy, thee fruitful and multiply thee and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. And as for me, <clears throat> when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. I have a... Uh, prevailing interest in the last words that a person speaks, how they conduct themselves in, in their death. Now, you don't want to fail to see the hand of God in the life of Jacob, because his life is indicative of the way the Lord leads and directs his people. It was in a more crude way than it is now that Christ has taken sin away and the whole Godhead lives in us. It's, the direction is a little more specific, and, but it's prefigured back here. It was very real, very real direction. Amen. One thing is very evident that although the people of God are in the world, it's not, as Solomon would call it, their long home. Jacob, as Abraham was, was promised the land of Canaan together with his seed, but they never really received it. Not because of any fault in him, it wasn't time yet. Jacob had a lot of experiences along the way. They were like epochs. I want to mention some of them. 
because they all they all blend together. Faith blended them all together for profit. He encountered competition with Esau. That wasn't pleasant. He encountered threats from Esau. He was handicapped permanently by a wrestling match with an angel. You know, you're never the same after you have an encounter with God. He was deceived into taking Leah for his wife when he thought he was receiving Rachel. That you got to kind of put yourself in that situation. Yeah, Jacob survived these things. I don't want to. He survived all of these things. Yeah. He worked for Laban for years without receiving any wages at all, and when he finally did, Laban changed him ten times. He spent twenty years in Pedanaram with a number of inconveniences. He was led to believe his favorite son Joseph was killed. He didn't learn, for many years he didn't learn that he wasn't. He had to face Esau thinking Esau was hostile. His daughter Dinah was raped. His sons overreacted to this act, act of aggression against Dinah and they slaughtered the Shechemites and was a great grief to, to Jacob. His eldest son Reuben lay with his concubine. Rachel died in Canaan when they were only a short distance from their destination. He endured three years of a five, with a seven year famine in Canaan, five years of it in Egypt. At 130 years of age, he took his entire family and moved to Egypt. Now, not many people could survive those things, but Jacob did. He received a lot of bad press. I'm forgiving him some good press now. So what do we learn from this? So we learn from these examples that God, who, those who are called by God are not summoned to trouble-free lives. Yeah. Yeah. To this day, many Christians are confused because they have trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To this day. Mm -hmm. I would even venture to say most Christians are confused by when they are, have a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. They haven't been taught properly. Yeah. This is the fault of the preachers and teachers and those who had in charge of making the people intelligent about the things of God and how He operates, but they have flunked. They did not do their job. And so there are, are several generations of people that have suffered because of it. Now the patriarchs and everybody else who were called into God's purpose lived out the doctrine that was taught by Jesus and the Apostles ahead of time, they lived it out. And we, we can't be naive about this or simplistic about this, disconcerted by all the inconveniences and confused by the trouble and why did this happen and so forth. Jesus made this clear in His teaching to His disciples. He said, if you were of the world, the world love his own, but you're not of the world, therefore the world hates you. And he told you, you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. You've got to learn, you got to learn to be, endure being hated. Yes. If you're really touchy about being hated, it's not going to go well with yeah. you. Not so much that you're going to be cursed or that just life will become such a burden to you, you won't be able to take it. Yeah. Jesus said, I don't think this, don't even think this, don't let this come into your mind, don't think this, don't think that I am come to send peace on the earth, don't even think that. Amen. Maybe you thought that, stop thinking it. Don't think I come to bring peace on earth. I came to... I came not to send peace, but a sword. 
I am come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. I've, I've come to define things a little finer than they've been defined before. I'm going to point out that people aren't as close as they let on. A lot of tight-knit families aren't really tight-knit. Hmm. He said, uh, Paul said, we glory in tribulations. Yeah. Church ought to be shouting about this time. Yeah. Knowing that tribulation works patience or endurance. How do you develop stick to itiveness? It's by being tribulated. <laughs> That's how Joseph became strong, Jacob became strong, because they went through a lot. It yeah. toughened them up, spiritually toughened them up. Paul said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, yeah. is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul said of the Thessalonians, no man should be moved by these afflictions. Don't be moved by these afflictions. Yeah. Don't be used in the assembly for a gripe session. Yeah. Don't be moved by these afflictions. Mm -hmm. I say, don't be moved by them. Amen. You yourselves know that we were appointed there too. Mm -hmm. that's, that's God appointed afflictions. That's what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing that the tri James said, knowing that the trying of your faith works patience, mm -hmm. endurance. Yeah. People that aren't tried, aren't faithful. That's right. Marvel not, brethren, if the world hates you, John said. So all of this is involved in, a, in a God taking the people out of the Gentiles for his name's sake. As Acts 15, 14 states, it's the result of actually becoming a stranger and pilgrim in the world. Do you know that a lot of professing Christians aren't strangers and pilgrims in the world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. They're at home in the world. Amen. They fit into the world. Yeah. The worldly people like them. The worldly people like to be around them. They like to be around the worldly people. They're of the world. That's what they are. Right. But see, those that God calls are not of the world. Amen. <laughs> now let's get into this text. Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen. They had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Now remember, we're, what we're reading about is the rate development of a nation mm -hmm. to whom God is going to give a son. And a child's going to be born to them, born to them, which is Jesus Christ, the Savior. He's culturing this nation. Yeah. Yeah. He started out with one, mm -hmm. Abraham, yeah. and he was as good as dead. Mm -hmm. And we had two, and Sarah, had, and she's barren. Yeah. And that's what we got started with now. Yeah. And then we had Isaac was added, and. It's beginning to grow, and now there. Now we got up to seventy. Come down into East Bed seven. So they develop a nation. Now he told it. He told Abraham he is going to develop a great nation from him. And the zeal of the Lord of Hosts is performing this, but he's not going about it like men would go about it. Men would be content to have a billion nutcases. Yeah, it looks good to them have a million people that are stupid. Yeah. No, I'm telling you the truth here. Yeah. Or in some movies have like three and a half million dropping a bucket, and they're all they're all ignorant. Mm -hmm. Just for a few, say for a few. So see the world. This isn't the way the world thinks. When God raised a nation up. He's going to bring along this knowledge. It's going to come along. What they do with it will be something else, but they're going to have it. Uh -huh. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's what Isaiah 9, 7 says. So what he's doing, he's developed, he's developing a God consciousness in these people. Yeah, he's demonstrating his own faithfulness to these people. He's confirming the rightness of divine choices to these people. He's establishing these things. People just know, don't know all these things naturally, and they can't just know them just by studying the Bible. Uh -huh. A lot of people study the Bible don't have any idea about this. Right. 
He's going to show the essentiality of what God says and does. That God doesn't do things that aren't necessary. He doesn't say things that aren't necessary. He doesn't require things that aren't necessary. God is not a God of the optional. He's culturing and perfecting faith. So these people, he works with Abraham, so he can stand up against Pharaoh. He can stand up against uh, several armies of men that captured Lot, remember? Yeah, yeah. He can stand up against uh, other people of the Philistines. He's perfecting their faith. Yeah. And he's distinguishing between faith and works. He's showing to what I tell you to do, you need me to do it. Amen. Yeah. If I say to Abraham, you're going to have seed, you're going to have, I'm going to have to be in the process or you won't have any. Yeah. These some people don't know this. He's showing what's involved in being separated from the world. Abraham was separate from the world, gave him a separate country from the world. Works separately with him as he doesn't work with anybody else in the world. He's demonstrating the true nature of life in this world. It's temporary, it's fraught with trouble, and there's got to be a better place. And he's also developing hope. He's culturing, he's, te he's working with people, so all of a sudden hope is a powerful incentive in people. He'll bring it to the point where there's really nothing they can do about the present. <laughs> there's nothing really you can do about the present. You don't have the power with all your smarts and everything. You can't change the present. So you learn to live by hope when God's going to change things. So these are just introductory, but see, these are things that God's teaching these people along the way. And God is showing people that nothing that God does can be done by natural means. All of God's promises, all of them, all of them require supernatural intervention. Yes. Amen. If God doesn't enter into the thing personally and powerfully, it's not going to happen. Now, until this, God had to teach people about the predicament in which they were found also. Now, until this very day, no nation has ever been able to invent a God like that. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot of gods. Who knows how many gods men have invented? Probably in the thousands. None of their gods, no god that man has invented does things like I just mentioned. Yeah, amen. The world's gods are nothing more than erroneous ideas crystallized in wood and stone. Yes, right. That's what they are. Now to teach men this, God had to be extensively involved with them, and, uh, and he was. Now with that as a, as a background, let's, let's peruse what this text has said. Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen. They're in a specific place. Uh, you will find that uh, when God really begins to work with the people, they have to be kind of located in a specific place. There's not a lot made known while you're wandering. Now, we're stranger pilgrims in the world, we're, but that's not equivalent to wandering. That's right. Wandering is like working in circles and getting nowhere. Right. We're going through the world to a destination. We're not wandering. And you'll find out that when people uh -huh. wander, God doesn't teach them. Uh -huh. yes. God doesn't teach wandering people. Uh -huh. He can do things that we could learn from what they, he did to those wandering people, but they didn't learn from him. Uh -huh. So he locates the people. <laughs> then he begins to work with them because there's something about moving about and a lot of sundry activities, there's something about that that dulls the hearing and makes the heart imperceptive. Is it just the way it works? You, uh, you'll learn this. If you have a lot of duties, you need a lot of grace or you get kind of scatterbrained. 
It's just, just what happens. So God now he's got them located in Goshen. The famine thing has been resolved for them. They've got sufficient food, so now he's, he begins to work with them. And they had possessions there. <laughs> they had something they owned. Oh, brethren, when you settle down someplace, you have to own something. Yeah. I'm not talking about worldly goods. Yeah, that's right. You have to own something. You have to have something. If you're, if God sets you in heavenly places, you got to own something when you're there. So you got to have it for your possession. Know it. Be assured of it. Be able to handle it. They had possessions there. They found a place to call home for the time. They got to accumulate possession. They, then they grew and they multiplied there. This is the first record in the Bible of unusual growth among the Israelites. This is the first mention of it. As when they were during a famine, they were in a located place with all their needs being met, and they began to multiply. When they entered into Egypt, all total, there was 70. Now they were in peaceful surroundings, mm -hmm. see? peaceful yeah. surroundings. Their needs are being met. They've got some possessions, which means they're attending to their mm -hmm. possessions, and now they begin to expand. Prior to this, he had expanded their flocks and their herds and their servants. And I give you the reference. But it's happened to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all increased their flocks, herds, and servants, but the people didn't increase. Yeah. Yeah. Now they experienced expansion. Later revelations of the expansion are cited. This began an expansion that didn't stop. Mm -hmm. Exodus 1.7 says they increased abundantly and multiplied. Exodus 1.12 says they multiplied and grew when they were afflicted. Exodus 1.20 says the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. See, this, this began. This, yeah. this verse we just read started something. Yeah. Amen. And going to increase. We're going to end up with a lot of people. Amen. Now I want to get out of room that this expansion was in order to possess the land. Yeah, that's right. Canaan was too big for 70 people mm -hmm. to manage it. Yeah, yeah. You, had to, you had to have a lot of people when they went in. Amen. Now thought of believers have long marveled at the slow growth of the church. It's a phenomenon that you, it's, it's impossible to me to explain. The proverbial 1040 window, I've been hearing about it for 40 years myself. It hasn't changed and we're still hearing about vast areas of the world that have, quote, never been exposed to the gospel this is very strange. Yeah. Around 60 AD, Paul wrote, The gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature under heaven. Uh -huh. I know some people that the then known and all this. But here's our other versions. Even the translators, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. They saw what this said. Which was preached in all creation under heaven. American Standard Version. NIV says, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Has been, has been. This is 60 AD we're talking about. Which has preached in all creation under heaven, has been preached all over the world, which has been preached as being designed for and offered without restrictions to every person under heaven. Amplified Bible. Now there's no question about what the text says. <laughs> Some people have a question about whether it means what it says, but no question about what it says. Amen. The language experts know what it says. Uh -huh. The linguists, they know what it says. The etymologists, they know what it says. It's the professed believers that have trouble with what it says. 60 AD, every creature under heaven heard the gospel. That's what it says. Amen. Now, I don't know how you could say that unless it was revealed. Yeah. How could it be possible for anyone in the first century to say that by experience. 
They couldn't. This had to be something that was revealed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't reveal lies. Amen. Amen. All happened within three decades. Within three decades of Christ's exaltation, yeah. all of this happened. And it was the result of godly spontaneity. It wasn't the result of planning and plotting and yes. purposing and counsels and this sort of thing. It was the result of the faithful and insightful proclamation of the gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. As you can see, this kind of growth, the, the kind of growth the modern church is experiencing is not the manner of New Testament growth. That's right. yeah. The book of Acts, I give you the references there, it was, it was an explosion of... Yes, that's right, yeah conversions. So why are the circumstances related to church growth so different today? Well, some will say it's not only that way. On a global scale, for instance, in China, the intelligent estimate is that there are 150 million Christians, underground Christians in China. That's about half the population of the United States. And it's happened in a relatively short period of time. The population of China is 1.344 billion. So 150 million, that's 3%. Now I ask you, how just how impressive is that? In America, for instance, there are 316 million people, 76 of which profess to be Christian, 76% of which profess to be Christians. that percentage is said to be decreasing, not increasing. Now, it's my opinion, this is kind of strong, but this, uh, this, uh, this is a settled, set, developed and settled opinion that the modern church is not strong enough to, have, to handle a great influx of believers. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's too weak. Yes. It's too untaught, too casual, too worldly. It would be similar to 70 people trying to occupy a Canaan. Yes, that's right, man. It couldn't. I mean, if, if, a, if, a, if a billion people were converted today, mm -hmm. it worked pandemonium in yes. the church world. Yeah, I think so, yes. They couldn't handle it. They'd all retrogress. Yeah. Now, what, if, what if when they were in, before they came to, to Egypt, what if they were increasing then, but they didn't have any corn, yes. they didn't have any way of maintaining that life, that's what, same thing? That's right, same thing. Yeah. Now I'm going to affirm that, that things are going to remain as they are now until the professed church grows up into Christ. Mm -hmm. yes. Until that happens, missions and outreach are going to be very minimal in their effect. If the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and it is, mm -hmm. you may rest assured that the work of God is not going to be done independently of the truth. And the modern right. church is short on truth. Mm -hmm. The solution is, Jesus said, give us a solution. Mark 12, 33, make the tree good. Yes, amen. Amen. So to my the majority of emphasis today should be put on getting the church up to speed out of the world and up to speed because the existence of the church makes it impossible to support any significant amount of conversions. We just end up with a more mediocrity. All of this is like demonstrated and illustrated in Israel growing and multiplying. He's getting them ready ready for to be his testifiers. That text says Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. 17 years. That's how old Joseph was when he left. You remember seven, he was 17. Now Jacob also leaves Canaan owing to a famine. Spent his last 17 years, which kind of matched the 17 years Joseph spent. He was able to spend these years with Joseph, his favorite son. So the, these, the latter years were better than the former years. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 
And the length of Jacob's life, the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. 77 years of that was spent in Canaan. 20 years of spent in Pedanaram. Then he went back into Canaan for 33 more years. That's 130 years, which he entered into Egypt and put 17 years there. So 147 years he lived. Now you have observed, I know, that the lifespan of man is shrinking up as we go through Genesis. It's shrinking. Adam lived 930 years. Noah lived on both sides of the flood. He lived 950 years. Shem lived 600 years. Abraham only lived 175 years. He saw it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. shrinking age. Jacob lived 147. Moses lived 120. Joshua lived 110. So see, the age is shrinking. Prior to the flood, average lifespans ranged from 930 to 595. The only exception being Enoch, who was translated when he was 350, I believe it was. After the flood, ages continued to decrease. Abraham's father, Tira, was the last man to live over 200 years. Nobody lived over 200 years. See, it's already, already it's went from 900 almost to a millennium, all shrunk down to 200. The point is that the death that was imposed in the race through Adam was, take, was taking effect, but it was... It was gradually diminishing, lest the lest the race be expunged. You, you ought to see why he allowed the people to live longer, so the race could increase more and survive. However, the hand of God eventually set a limit on the average life. Moses said in his psalm, "Is a seventy, if by reason of strength, four score or eighty." We learn from this, say the power of death was given to the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then say then Jesus defeated. Yeah. The power of death was given to the devil. And God destroyed Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. Mm -hmm. That is the Amen. that is the devil. But Satan cannot operate independently. Yeah. Even though this world, the glory of it was given to him, kingdom mm -hmm. given to him, and he had power that he can't operate independently. Yeah. He's under God. So now we read that the time drew nigh that Israel must. <clears throat> and the time drew nigh when Israel must yeah. die. It's appointed yeah. unto man wants to die. The words that time do nigh speak of something that had been determined. Mm -hmm. See, that's the language of determination. Yeah, right. The time he must die approached. Mm -hmm. That means it was a de divine determination. Solomon himself said, uh, there's a time mm -hmm. to die. David said, my times, mm -hmm. we'd say our lifetime. Yeah. My times are in thy hand. Yeah. So God determines how long, how long you live. According to Scripture, it's possible for a man to die before his time, because the foolishness to be have to leave the world before his appointed time. Here Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, "Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldst thou die before thy time?" David said, "There were men who shall not live out half their days." He said. Just because a man's been appointed to live so long doesn't mean he's going to. Yeah. Uh -huh. Solomon also wrote, the years of the wicked shall be shortened. And God also has the power to lengthen yes. a person's life. He said to Hezekiah, I'll add to thy days 15 years. See, so God has control of this. In the case of Jacob, God didn't lengthen his days, and he didn't cut them short either. Mm -hmm. He was able to... I would say that that's a blessing to be able to live out yeah. Amen. your life. Mm -hmm. 
not have it cut short because of foolishness. Now, there are several scenes of death in Scripture, not many, but there are several, and I'll list them there for you. Because it's important to see what happened when people died. If you know that your life is in God's hands and that your death is not an accident, you can do things at your death that you almost be astounded. You can pray for your enemies like Stephen did. Or you can say, I'm ready to be offered like Paul did. I'm ready. So Joseph, uh, Jacob calls Joseph his son. He said to him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. So he calls his son Joseph. He doesn't call Reuben his firstborn. He doesn't call Benjamin his lastborn. He doesn't call Judah. He calls Joseph. The matter he's going to address is the holy lineage. And the identity that he's going to leave in the world. What kind of testimony is he going to leave in the world? In matters pertaining to the covenant, Joseph, who was normally over Jacob, see? Mm -hmm. But in the matter of the covenant, Jacob was over him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So when, he, when Jacob moved to Egypt, Joseph managed him. But when it came to the covenant and with establishing identity with God, Jacob managed Joseph. Amen. Amen. For Jacob, Joseph was a place where he was graciously sustained during a famine. However, although he lived there for 17 years, he didn't want to be a, a citizen of Egypt. He didn't want to be known as an Egyptian. He did not want to be buried there. He knew his body was a part of himself. Yes. He wanted his body, after he was dead, uh -huh. to be in the land of Canaan. He desired to make a clear statement, so to speak, concerning where he really belonged. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. that testimony. Now, I have a keen interest in how people think who have, been, who have had profitable exposure to God. Uh -huh. how, how do they think? Now here's a man of faith chosen by God, and he thinks about the handling of his body after he's dead. Yes, amen. Now, we've been introduced to the concept of burial as held by those who have personal connection with God. It's everywhere through Scripture. Mm -hmm. God told Abraham, you'll be buried in the good old age. Abraham procured a place and said, I want to bury my dead. Abraham buried Sarah's wife. Mm -hmm. Abraham's sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried. Mm -hmm. Abraham, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried. Rachel died, she was buried. Isaac gave up the ghost, he was buried. The word bury means to interior mm -hmm. or deposit a dead body in the earth or in a tomb. Mm -hmm. In the New Covenant writings, we are told that after Jesus laid down his life, they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with spices in the manner of the Jews, is, which is the, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Yeah. Amen. I'm an advocate of burial. I, I don't know how you could be anything Amen. else. In the text I just mentioned, John 19:40, bury means to prepare a body for burial by the use of every requisite provision and funeral adornment to wit baths, vestments, flowers, wreaths, perfumes, libations. See, they washed the body, perfumed the body, wrapped the body, buried the body. Yeah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they buried their dead. Mm -hmm. and they wanted to be buried. Now, I've heard more arguments than I wish to cite. They say it doesn't make any difference what happens to your body after you die. Who cares what happens to your body? Do what you want with it. That be any difference. I mean, I've heard people argue this. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you, and if you talk about it, you'll hear them talk like this too. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way godly men of old thought. Amen. God Himself thought for thought this way for He Himself buried Moses. Yeah. If anyone could have cremated somebody, it'd have been God. Yeah. Buried Moses. Mm -hmm. 
Not to mention the fact that one facet of the gospel is that Christ was buried. Yeah. Yeah. I want to lie with my fathers. I want my body to be where my people were buried. Yeah. Their burying place. It's a special place. For their mm -hmm. Special cemetery yeah. for the people with faith. This was the cave of Machpelah, mm -hmm. part of the property Abraham purchased to bury Sarah. Mm -hmm. There in the cave of Machpelah, Sarah was buried. Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Leah, and Jacob, they were buried there too. Mm -hmm. I give an ancient artist rendition of that cave picture there. And then today they've built a they have built a structure some years ago around this place, mm -hmm. and it's like I guess you call it a shrine. Mm -hmm. It's a place of honor and dignity, a burying place. Mm -hmm. And I was raised up where people were particular about how you took care of cemeteries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I've seen cemeteries that have been overgrown too. Yeah. You know. Used to be. Country churches, they had their own cemetery. Mm -hmm. By the side of the church be a cemetery. I believe Brother Russell Cole was buried in that kind of cemetery is right next to the building. It reflects a, a good way of thinking. Yes, amen. Amen. <laughs> now I give, I include here, I'm not going to read it, but I include here an article I wrote by request on some time ago on cremation. Because since we've lived here, there's been some people, Christ, some well-known Christian people cremated. I was sort of a, kind of astounded, mm -hmm. but this has happened. And you can get a good deal on cremation mm -hmm. from the mortician. And they'll do it for hundreds of dollars instead of thousands. Mm -hmm. To some people having a high estimate of unrighteous mammon, mm -hmm. choose the cheaper route. not wise. Now to me it's a sad circumstance when professing Christians living over 4,000 years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob mm -hmm. know less about what they should do and bury it with the dead than they know. Yeah, right. I mean, this is a disgrace. Mm -hmm. Too much has happened since those days to be confused on this subject. Mm -hmm. Of burial. Now during during the interim of about 33 years after the death of Christ and preceded by over 400 millennia, I'm establishing now that this is a day of greater light. During a period of about three and a half years, sin was put away, Satan was destroyed, Evil principalities and powers were plundered. A new and living way to God was opened up. A new covenant was ratified. Jesus delivered us from this present evil world. Jesus has been exalted to give repentance. In Christ is a new creation. Jesus is presently interceding for those coming to God. The redeemed have access to the grace of God. The Holy Spirit has been given to those who are in Christ. The Holy Spirit leads the saved to mortify, mortify the deeds of the body. The grace of God brings salvation and teaches them how to live rejecting worldliness and ungodly lusts. The world has been reconciled to God. In salvation, God works in us both to will and do of his own good pleasure. God blesses people with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And the saints have been given exceeding great and precious promises whereby we may be made partakers of the divine nature. Now, I ask you, <clears throat> How is it possible to justify, excuse, or explain away the glaring fact that spiritual ignorance is running rampant in the modern church? How exactly can that be justified? I call into account mm -hmm. the people that have created this miserable condition. Amen. And I rebuke those who try and justify it as though it was normal. Yes. Amen. It's not. See right. these people back there? Mm -hmm. They didn't have a Bible. The people we read about, I've read about, they didn't have a Bible. Mm -hmm. And they had very few revelations down in the single digits. Mm -hmm. Revelations from God. But they knew more mm -hmm. about critical matters of life and death than the people of this generation. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it is a serious condition. Amen. 
Paul asked this question, and it's, it's good to ask men to answer it. If, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? If we're all sinners, just we're forgiven. If that's true, did Christ minister this situation? Is Christ the reason why we're still sinners? No. These people to say we are. It, did Jesus do that or not? God forbid. And if he didn't, let's have a cessation of this foolish talk. That's right. If men are honest enough, they'll know why this situation happened. That's right. It happened because he that committed sin is of the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The people who promoted this were the devil's disciples. That's right. Amen. Oh, they didn't say they were the devil's disciples. I know that they were too dumb to say that, mm -hmm. too insensitive to say that. But they were ignoble vessels. Mm -hmm. God has provided for better results. Yes. Joseph, this is what Joseph Jacob said, this is what I want you to do. Don't bury me in Egypt. Yeah. This is part of me here. Mm -hmm. Joseph right away, he doesn't hesitate, doesn't say, Well, let me let me think about this, Dad. Let me let me think about this. This is um it's a weighty consideration. He says I will do it as thou hast said. Now I want to dwell on this for a moment. <clears throat> Here he, Joseph, since he's been 17, he's now he's right about 40. So what, what about 23 years, 22 to 23 years he's been in Egypt. And he's still able to reason this thing out. Yes. There has not been one single Jew beside him in all of Egypt land. Mm -hmm. There wasn't one single Jew mm -hmm. up until Jacob came there. There's no one teaching mm -hmm. a Jew's religion. Yet he had integrity to know what to do. He always knew what to do. When he was made a steward of Potiphar's house, he worked excellently and God was with him. When he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he responded godly and refused mm -hmm. to be lured. And when he was in prison, he knew how to conduct himself, yeah. made the head of the prisoners. When he was asked to interpret dreams, he knew how to give glory to God and where to get the answer. Mm -hmm. When he stood before Pharaoh, he knew how to conduct himself. He knew how to give glory to God. He knew how to receive an interpretation, and he knew how to reason on it. He was sensitive enough to know how to manage what needed to be done during years of plenty and during years of famine. He knew how to manage the distribution of grain that had been stored during the years of plenty, and all of this was done with the instruction he had during the first 17 years of his life. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Ah, this is something to ponder. During the past century or so, Christian children's books have become quite popular. Mm -hmm. But I don't like them. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of them I don't care for at all. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you why. They're too shallow. Yeah. They do not assist in embedding in youthful minds fundamental thoughts. In the case of Joseph, the things he had to learn during the first 17 years now, things which he learned. All he could learn is what had been revealed, but here it was. He learned about the creation of the heavens and the earth, the fall of man, the consequence of Adam's sin, the distinction between Cain and Abel, the cursing of Cain, the flood, the judgment of Shinar, and the call on Abraham. He learned about the promises made to Abraham, the covenant made with Abraham, Isaac the child of promise, and the distinction between Isaac and Esau, both in character and manner of life. He learned about the promises related to the land of Canaan, the revelation of God to Abraham about Israel's tenure in a strange land, and the experiences of the fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He learned all this by the time he's 17. 
We know these were effectively communicated as God said that Abraham would be faithful. We know they were communicated faithfully and accepted because of the way these people acted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. under certain circumstances. They didn't hear stories. Yeah. Uh -huh. and that's not what they were told. There's something about a story that does that moves the person hearing it not to connect it with reality. There's uh -huh. unless there's some explanation yeah. uh -huh. what they, what they mean by story. Uh -huh. These offspring grew up with a holy familiarity with the nature of God, uh -huh. the promises of God, the choice of Abraham's seed, the promise of the land of Canaan. They grew up uh -huh. tutored in these things. In a similar, but on a significantly larger scale, the children of the saints are to be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They are to become, at a young age, they are to become familiar with God's choice of his people, the promises given to them, the nature of life in Christ, they are to become familiar. Whether they comprehend it all, that's not even the point. That's not the point. The point is to communicate it. The understanding comes later. You don't yeah. wait till a child can understand, then tell them. Uh -huh. yes. You Amen. tell them so when they come to understand, they'll be out comprehending what they've yeah. been taught. Amen. Completely, I, yes. I can remember my mother telling me, reading the accounts, and then she would stop and she would say, this is not a story. This is an account of what happened to yeah. a real person. <laughs> but that really changed the way I thought about uh -huh. it. Oh, yes. Amen. 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 By a relatively young age, children of believers should know the reason man was created. They should know about the fall of man, the consequences of the fall, the revealed nature of God, things that are learned by the example of Israel, the nature of man, the need of salvation, the nature and effectiveness of salvation, why Jesus came into the world. And I won't read all of those, but they should... At a, at a relatively young age, they should be exposed to this teaching. Amen. This is why I'm against Christian, uh, against children's church and nurseries. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm against them. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to condemn anyone if they choose to go that way, but it's, a, it's an inferior way, and what that way has produced is enough yeah. testimony. We don't need any more. I pass this, uh, my, these are my personal mm -hmm. perceptions. I pass these along because of my own persuasion that too much Christian teaching for children is on a sentimental mm -hmm. and unwarranted childish level. Yeah. The scriptures don't provide us details with how the patriarchs taught their children. I mean, it's, it's not there. Mm -hmm. And at this time they had their Bible studies over. They did, it doesn't tell you that. Mm -hmm. It's evident that they taught them well. Yeah. <laughs> I want to comment on this a little more. In our time, there's an approach to teaching children that does not lead them to spiritual maturity by the time they're 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With Jesus, it was by the time he was 12. Yeah. For myself, I believe the environment and obvious commitment to the will of God has, has to be the preeminent trait in the home. The parents should not have to emphasize, now we're serving God. That should be an interpretation, not a revelation. They should live so when they say that, the children can make the connection. I'm convinced that there's too many extracurricular activities. I'm emphasizing this as my own view. See, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to shove this down anyone's throat. If I could, I would, but I won't do that. There's too many extracurricular activities that rob the homes of professing believers. There's too much of the home life is built around the children. Now, this wasn't so when I was raised up. This was not so. I mean, no, no, like nobody did this mm -hmm. when I was being raised up. Mm -hmm. The children were built around the parents' agenda. Mm -hmm. That's how it was. 
Even when we had beef, had meals, the children ate last. <laughs> That's the way I was raised up. I think I was 13 before I knew that this little part of a chicken wig wasn't the chicken leg. I thought it was a chicken leg. Because the chicken legs were always gone when us kids got to the... It was a different philosophy. I'm showing that the thinking of people has been altered significantly. So I call upon people to consider these things and raise your children like, how would you have raised John the Baptist? Huh? Zacharias and Elizabeth, they're old, very old. Mm -hmm. They raised him up so he, was, he could go out in the wilderness and be raised and not miss a beat. Mm -hmm. If you were Mary and Joseph, how would you have raised Jesus? Would you have gone to the Passover? Walk, you walked. Would you have walked to the Passover every year? Or would you have said, we're going to be busy this year? We're not, Sorry, folk, we're not able to come this year. we got some other. Mm -hmm. What would you have done? Well, that's why Mary and Joseph raised, yeah, <laughs> raised right. Jesus, and that's why Zacharias and Elizabeth raised John the Baptist. Because they had a different view of things. I personally know of people who have raised their children in a morally sound environment. Mm -hmm. Even homeschooled the children. Mm -hmm. Made sure they didn't do things that were obviously sinful. When those children came into the assembly, they were bored out of their skulls. I've seen this. I could name names, but I won't. They didn't know the things of God. They were unfamiliar. They might sleep under a chair or something. They just I'm talking about kids who could learn. Why was that? In all their zeal to teach their children, they had omitted raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And it doesn't really make any difference what they say. When Jesus was 12, he preferred to be with those who understood Scripture. Hmm? Why was he that way at 12? It wasn't like a miracle. He grew in wisdom and stature. It wasn't like dropped into his mind. This is the result of Mary and Joseph, how they raised Jesus. This is why he could be subject to his parents and not lose anything. Now, there's no method to be taught on how you accomplish this, but and many of you are raising your children correctly, but it's just something to think about. It's something to ponder. Amen. Yes? Several times tonight I've thought about the text the, the, he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the gospel shed it sheds light on on these matters that you're talking about. Yes, amen. Uh, teaching and raising children and, and just the, the the general direction of life, not just for children, but you know, in the, all all the necessary uh, uses and and activities and stewardship of life in general, the gospel sh sheds light. On, on those things, it doesn't guarantee that we'll always have every detailed answer for for everything, but it it means that you you have an answer for for the the, the general taste of life. You'll be able to things won't overcome you. You'll you, you won't you won't be weighted down with more questions. You know, questions and doubts can be hard burdens to bear. Um, but in in regards to the uh, these these words of, of Jacob, there is a like in a shadow sense, the knowledge of God also brought life and immortality That's to right. light. That's right. In, in, a, in a dimmer light, because That's they right. they had they had a sense of of righteousness and of, and of uh, responsibility to God and of and of judgment and the the impact of life in this world. Uh, they, they weren't able to express it in words like, like we do, but they, they spoke of being gathered to their people yes, and amen. things like that. So the knowledge of God, it brought life and immortality to light in a lesser, in a lesser way. Something that I thought of while you, while you were talking about cremation, just yesterday I heard on the news, a, a secular news source, that over the past 20 years, cremation has increased by 20%. Mm -hmm. 
And this news reporter connected that to the decrease of religion in, mm. in our country. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was a rather perceptive yes. Yes, fact. Was. He even yes. went so far to say, as a lot of people even forego a funeral altogether. Yeah. They don't don't even have a service. They cremate and don't even have have a service. Mm -hmm. the, the knowledge that that indicates the ignorance of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's good just to personally <clears throat> ponder these things without a mind to making laws. The idea is to reflect mm -hmm. the knowledge of God in in your decisions, and that's that's something you have to really work at. So Jacob says, swear to me, mm -hmm. he says, uh, for, he says, Jacob, said, Joseph said, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, he says, swear to me, <laughs> take, take an oath about this. See, this is important. Mm -hmm. It isn't that Jacob sus suspected that Joseph wouldn't do it. It's, mm -hmm. That wasn't it. It was to, to accent the importance this was part of his race. He's still raising up Joseph with an urge and admonition yeah. to the Lord when Joseph's over 30 years old, about 40 years old. He still know this is important. It's important for us to have this identity with the promised land. Bury me. Bury me in the, my father's burying place. I want to be connected in my death with the people God has chosen. If you didn't have any other reason for being buried, that'd be another, that's another good reason there. Joseph learned well from this because he also followed that example That's right. in his own books. That's right. Yeah. So this is important to me. Confirm it with an oath. Now vows and oaths are considered important in Scripture. So Jacob made a vow to the God. Jacob made a vow to the God of Israel. You'll get me out of this, surely I'll give a tenth unto thee, and I'll, I'll live for you. In pleading to the Lord for a child, Hannah made a vow to God. David vowed unto the Lord. When Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he, he said, I'll pay my vow. He vows. Under the law of Moses, there was a category of lawful expressions called your vows. David wrote of paying his vow. Paul's described during his ministry of his as having taken a vow. Now, not all vows are good. Mm -hmm. Solomon wrote, It is a trap for a man to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider his vows. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a trap. Mm -hmm. Jephthah, of course, made a vow. Remember when he said, Give me this victory I'll offer to you. The first thing that comes out to meet me in here was his daughter. point of the text is that it was most serious matter to Jacob, one that related to the Abrahamic covenant. See, his thinking had been so molded by God's choice of Abraham that even in dying, he's thinking about, mm -hmm. about this. God had chosen the people. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Now, the other versions translated in a variety of ways. Here's some of them. He bowed in worship. He worshiped as he leaned on top of his staff, NIV. He gave worship on the Lord's, on the bed's head. Israel slumped down at the head of the bed. He bowed in thanks at the head of the bed. He worshiped on the bed's head. Israel adored God, turning to the bed's head. He bowed down in prayer with his face at the head of his bed. He did reverence leaning on top of his staff. Israel worshiped as he leaned on top of his staff. Jacob bowed humbly at the head of the bed. Soon afterwards, Jacob took to his bed. Israel did obeisance on top of his cane. Jacob bowed down and prayed at the head of the bed. Israel laid his head back down on the bed. Jacob gave thanks there on the bed. He bowed down in prayer with his face at the head of the bed. Israel collapsed on his bed. He bowed his head in submission and gratitude from his bed. So his 19, <laughs> 19 different representations all purporting to come from the original language. 
So I, so I do accept the authorized version. The authorized version is the King James Version. That's what it's called. Mm -hmm. It's the authorized version. Mm -hmm. It's just a version that, that, that the whole of the people agreed upon. Yeah. Uh -huh. This isn't true of the updates. That's right. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the result of agreement. Mm -hmm. It was just a handful of people. So what can we learn from this? To associate every aspect of life with God. Yeah, amen. Amen. From your birth, mm -hmm. He formed me in the womb. Yeah. See, from the birth down to the death. Amen. Associate it mm -hmm. with God. It teaches us that today men are taught to compartmentalize mm -hmm. life. Chop it up in little pieces. And then ask God to bless each piece. <laughs> but that's not that's not the scriptural way. Mm -hmm. The whole of life is dedicated to the Lord, then everything you do Amen. is Amen. unto Him. Amen. Men try and harmonize what they're doing with God. This is not this is not the right approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not the right approach. It is that you do something, then you harmonize it with living for God. You live for God. Yeah. Then that dictates what you do. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In Christ, we're taught to have a single focus, mm -hmm. a one thing mentality. Yeah. That's the way Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the way they were. They had a single God, God's promise, God's mm -hmm. land. They, that was their focus. This manner of thinking is unfortunately, sadly missing. Mm -hmm. But to show you how serious that is, <clears throat> The faith of Abraham is presented to us as a, an example of real faith. Mm -hmm. See, rarely do you hear the faith of Abraham delineated today, but see, it is in Scripture. Abraham's the father of the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. It refers to us who are of the faith of Abraham, Romans 4, 16. Now we know therefore that they, they that are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Galatians 3, 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. <coughs> Galatians 3, 14, That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through faith, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now if these texts are true, then those who do not possess the righteousness of faith do not, do not are they're not righteous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Faith of Abraham. They who are, who have not received grace, mm -hmm. which comes through faith, they're not the children of Abraham. That's right. They're not participants in the promise of Abraham. They've not received the promise of the Spirit, which is through him and through faith of him. Mm -hmm. So if this is true, then when we read of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we should be alert and yeah. uh -huh. pick up on what it says about them because we're being exposed to real, mm -hmm. real faith. Real faith yields real results. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Spurious faith yields spurious results. Yeah. It came to pass after these things, so we, we leap. We don't know how long this is, but leap to the next significant thing. Someone told Joseph, Joseph your father's sick. Came to pass. That's language, calendar language. In other words, God is governing this whole situation. Now we come to the time, Jacob's time to die approaches, and he grew sick. Word used there means he became a weakened state. In other words, his his body began to shut down as he got ready to die. Mm -hmm. My father is sick. I'm a more sensitive about these things now than I was when I was younger, but you can kind of sense when you're approaching, approaching the time. And yeah, we call for our Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> we approach that we call for our Joseph, mm -hmm. Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. <clears throat> and Joseph, he knows, he knows what to do. Remember, all, all up to this time, Joseph knew what to do, so he knew what to do. So he took his two sons, yeah. 
They weren't little boys. Mm -hmm. They were born before the famine. Yeah. Scriptures tell us it. These Ephraim and Manasseh were born before the famine. Mm -hmm. They went through the seven years of the famine. Mm -hmm. And now Jacob, we're at the end of 17 additional years, so they're in their 20s. Mm -hmm. These are not two little boys that you yeah. hold by. Yeah. <laughs> you see pictures of little. Yeah. These are grown up men. Well over 20 years of age, he brings him with him. I got he was directed by God to do this. I don't know why else he would do this. He took his two sons. See, there are, uh, it appears as though there are a few precious souls who know to do the right thing. They can't, they can't do the right thing. They always seem to do the wrong thing. Joseph always seemed to do the right thing. Yeah, right. He knew what to do. Now, there's, there are still souls that know what to do. On the day of Pentecost, when these people heard Peter's message, they knew what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. What shall we do? Yeah. They do. Yeah. Ethiopian Union, he heard Philip yeah. preach Christ, he knew what to yeah. do. Yeah. Here's why, or what hinders me? I gather that he had just, what he had heard is that Jesus was baptized. He said, why can't I be too? What, what's, why was hindering me? He knew what to do. Saul of Tarsus, when he was confronted with Jesus, he knew what to do. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? See, once he knew who it was. Philippian jailer, he, he knew what to do. What was I doing to be saved? He knew what to do. See, there are people that, they have opportunities to either be converted or to grow up into Christ, but they hear the thing, but they don't know what to do. Yeah, that's right. They can't, so people try and coerce responses out of them. They do it, change the tone of the music, change the lighting system, try and... People have to know what, if you're going to do the right thing, you have to know God's not going to prod you into the path. He's going to prod you to wake you up, yeah. but it'll bring you to a time where you know what to do. Amen. Some people preach such a powerless message hmm. that they have to continually tell the people what they have to do to be saved. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. Right. Mm -hmm. They have to repeat this over and over and over and over. Why? Because their message is powerless. Yeah. A powerful message, the people will interrupt. Yeah. Amen. Boy, that'd be a refreshing thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, someone told Jacob, Joseph's, Joseph's coming. Mm -hmm. And he, Israel strengthened himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an intriguing phraseology. In other words, say he collected his strength or rallied his strength. Now listen, there's some words that when they're spoken to you, you can rally. You may have been like depleted and kind of wore out, and but there's certain words you kind of revives you. You can gather your strength. I experience this on a daily, on a daily basis. Most of the time when I awaken, I'm not feeling too well. I get into the things of God, and I find I'm able to strengthen myself. I don't even have to call for somebody to do it. I strengthen myself. That's what happened here. He's getting ready to die. Mm -hmm. His strength has dissipated. He's been laying in bed. He strengthened himself and sat up mm -hmm. for the occasion. Well, Israel enters in, and Jacob testifies to him. Mm -hmm. He's probably told these things to his other boys many times. It's been a while since he talked to Joseph, but he said, um, God Almighty appeared unto me in Luz. That's where the ladder was set up, reached into heaven, the angels ascending and descending, carrying out the will of God, God himself at the head of the ladder. God appeared unto me. I don't know if you'll have opportunity to do this, but... If you do, before you die, give a witness to what yeah. God has done for you. Amen. Testify how he saved you, how you 
came to you through the gospel and what a blessed thing it was. Yeah. God appeared unto me. There's spiritual epoch, epochs like this that adapted him for the times. And he had several of these kind of epochs. And God said to me, and God said to me, the precise wording is recorded in Genesis 28. I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south, and in thee shall and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Yeah, Genesis 28, 13 through 15. Now Jacob, he gave a summation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, he didn't just he didn't just like quote this. He gave a an intelligent summation, mm -hmm. which means he comprehended what God said. Because you can't you can't sum up what you don't understand. Yeah, right. You can't give a summation of something that the, that you don't understand or perceive. Mm -hmm. Now traditionally. This kind of reasoning has eluded contemporary Christian leaders. They have such an inordinate penchant for details that they can't provide a valid summation, which a summation provokes thought. See, if you know, if you know the details, someone gives a summation in your mind, you can go over that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can, yes, Brother Jason. In a sense, this promise is a summation of the Bible. <laughs> That's right, amen. This, this promise is repeated throughout the book of Genesis. Yes, amen. It's repeated multiple times to Abraham, it's repeated to Isaac, it's repeated yeah. to Jacob. Now, Jacob himself is repeating it to Joseph. This, and this, if you read through the rest of Scripture, this is one of the mega themes of this promise God made to Abraham and then God fulfilling the promise. Amen. In a sense, that is the revelation Amen. of Scripture. In a sense. Amen. That's there's a lot more there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. You know, That's a summation. But Paul that is called a summation. it the gospel. He said the gospel was preached. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some have called it the embryo. Embryo, yes. Yes. But you can see that, can't you? That to, to give a summation requires insight mm -hmm. to the details. Mm -hmm. Paul, he, Paul reasons on that extensively in Galatians yes, 3, yes, which I does. think is a key mm -hmm. uh, chapter. And Paul says that was the original statement of the divine purpose. Amen. The law, as important as it was, mm -hmm. it was added. added. That's right. added. The law was not the point. Amen. The commandments yes. given in the law was not the point. Amen. The point was this promise Amen. that God gave to Abraham, fulfilled in Christ, who is the seed, the mm -hmm. seed of Abraham. Amen. That's glorious. Mm -hmm. Now the apostles, they, they talk like this too, but it's confusing to a traditionalist or legalist. For example, Peter summed up the uh, appropriation of salvation in these words. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah. See, that's, that's not a step. That's a summation. Yep. <laughs> See? Paul said, the same in Romans 10, 13. He said the same thing. Mm -hmm. On another occasion, he said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That was a summation. That wasn't a step. Mm -hmm. It was a summation. Peter said, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even, even as they. That was a summation. See, they gave a summation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit how long it was before I was able to, <laughs> to see this, but once I saw it, it's, it's marvelous. Some people have trouble with these things. See, they say, well, that, you can't, it's not enough just to believe. <laughs> yeah. You've got to do something else. But that's a sum, that's a, there's a lot in belief. That's right. Amen. It's like a separate system itself, so to speak. Promises the same way. It's, it's the same, same thing. Yeah. It's like a it's like a fruit, a piece of fruit that's filled with seeds. Amen. Indeed, right. shall all nations be blessed. Right. That was 
Yes. If you if you follow that Abraham promise through it, actually encapsulated in that was the promise of the new creation. Amen. The new heavens and the new earth is in there. The Amen. Holy Spirit. The pro Paul connected it to the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's connected to the salvation of the Gentiles. Everything's there in that promise. Mm -hmm. yes. they're, they're preaching opened up that promise. Yeah. yeah. The details are to be understood in view of the summation, mm -hmm. not, not just the opposite. It is that you add up the details and you get the summation. In the scriptures, <coughs> in spiritual life, learning is top down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, the, in the earth you learn, you learn ABCs, rudiments, yeah. number tables. You start at the bottom, you learn up. Yeah. But in Christ, you learn the main things first. Yes. Uh, Christ, Christ died. What happened? Uh -huh. Then, and you learn down. You can learn the details as you come. That's, and if you're truthful, this is how you learn the details. Uh -huh. This is how you all of a sudden was convinced of what you should do as you knew this mm -hmm. yes. summation. If the intent of God is to bless, uh -huh. mm -hmm. if that's His intent. Mm -hmm. This just changes how you think about details. Uh -huh. Amen. What you touched on there is why people don't understand the Bible. That's right. right. That's yes. exactly why. They, they go at it from the bottom up instead of from the top down. Mm -hmm. That's right. She has known to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob what was made known to them basically fell into two categories. Your seed's going to be multiplied. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the land. Yeah. Then the ultimate result, all the world will be blessed. Mm -hmm. But, yes. You learn from the top down of the grand scheme of why he's blessing, or you just learn that he's blessing, but as you um, continue in Christ, you learn, okay, the technical details of why he's blessing, and know how you can be a part of that blessing, continue to be a part of that blessing, and such as um, just using um, just salvation. It's a very broad, uh, broad work that as you continue in Christ, you learn about how salvation is worked out in you. Just from that top down. That's scene. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're able to identify what you're doing yeah. with what God is doing. Uh -huh. And it's yeah. like uh, it says in Ephesians 1, I think it's 18, that the eyes of your understanding being in light. Uh -huh. Yes, the amen. Lord gives you understanding like why he has this great scheme of salvation and this great um, blessing uh, canopy. And you understand, okay, what's holding that up? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some, some people, and this is encouraged by a lot of TV Christianity, mm -hmm. present God as be helping you meet your objectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. kind of what, boils, right. what yeah. it boils down to. But this is, it, this is God calling you into yes. what he is doing. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Now notice what uh, Jacob sees these two boys. Mm -hmm. Ephraim and Manasseh. And he says, Now, thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee in Egypt, are mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, he, he adopted them. That's right, yeah. The point of Joseph's sons, they, they must have been in their 20s, as I said. Joseph, we learn from Scripture, and I give you somewhere here the text, he was to receive a double portion. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But it was going to be dispensed through these That's right. sons. So Jacob is saying, these are not my grandsons. Uh -huh. yes. These are my sons. And they were given, uh -huh. a sep each one, a separate inheritance. Joseph received his inheritance through uh -huh. his sons. Jacob has no regard to what others might think. Yeah, that's, right. that's not fair. You know, not at all. And in fact, when he does bless his sons, he'll bring up some of these things in the 49th chapter. Yeah. See, Jacob is speaking as a prophet. Yeah, amen. You've, got to, you've got to see that. This, uh -huh. Jacob is speaking as a prophet. He's not speaking as a father in the realm of just a father. Mm -hmm. He's speaking in the, realm of a, in the role of a prophet. In this matter, he will also address the sin of Reuben, which appeared to be kind of swept under the rug for a long time. Then he says, Thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine. 
they'll be called after the name of their brethren, their inheritance. Now, we don't know if Joseph had any more children or not. The scriptures don't say, but if he did, they would not receive an inheritance himself. They would be under the headship of Ephraim and Manasseh mm -hmm. yeah. if they were born. As for me, gives a closing test, but as for me, that's just like a man of God he saves his own testimony to last, so to speak. As for me, when I came out from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way. We were yet but a little way to come to Ephrath, and I buried her there by the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. I know that that touched the heart of Jacob even then when he told about that. Mm -hmm. It's hard experience. She died in childbirth, you'll remember, mm -hmm. giving birth to Benjamin. As for me, you know, Rachel died right there by the side of me, yeah. remember? Yeah. We were in Canaan, though. She died in Canaan. She died in Canaan. Yeah. Just had a little way to go. We were not far from Bethlehem when she died. I buried her there by the side of the road that goes to Bethlehem. If you read back at the account, he raised a pillar up there. Moses, who's writing several years later, quite a few years later, he said the pillar's still there. Remains to this day. <laughs> still there. As 200, Moses wrote about this 200 years later, and 200 years later, there was that pillar yeah. on the road leading to Bethlehem yeah. where Rachel was buried. As far as we know, Jacob set up four pillars where he had the dream of the ladder. He didn't have set up a pillar there. Mm -hmm. When he made a covenant with Laban, you remember, mm -hmm. they wouldn't do any harm. Let's set up a pillar there. When God made him come on out of Padanaram and renewed his covenant with him, he set a pillar up there. When he buried Rachel, he set a pillar up there. These were these were epochs in his life he didn't want to mm -hmm. he didn't want to forget. Yeah. What God pleased to do to him. Yeah. The final separation from troublemaker Laban. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. When God renewed his covenant to him and Confirmed, I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you till I've done everything I said I was going to do. Yeah. And this when he lost his favorite wife, mm -hmm. yeah. woman that he loved. Mm -hmm. These are the things he wanted to remember. That's right. Yeah. And he told, mm -hmm. told jo Joseph about it. What a sensitive soul this man was, Jacob. Now these are very particular things that he said, and he did when he was approaching death, and he was beginning the deterioration process that had already begun. He had to strengthen himself, but it wasn't his mind that was so much strengthened as his body. Mm -hmm. He brought his body up so he could keep up with his mind. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I know what that's about. You know what that's about? You know what it's about to be to bring your body where it can kind of keep up with your mind? Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Yeah, you can you can do that. Mm -hmm. You can't do it at will, I don't think, yeah. but well, I'm going to end there tonight. I I got a lot out of this. Amen. Very, very tender. I think this is all said, all this happened when someone's getting ready to die. Yeah. Normally that'd be like a crisis mode and, you know. I mean, I've been, I've been in rooms where people gather and people die and nobody knows what to talk about. So people joke and they don't know what to, they don't what to say, they don't know how to act. That wasn't the case here. That's right. <laughs> Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Sister Barbara? <laughs> by the testimony of an effective wife lived at the point seen at this time in death, when someone is so fervent about something in the hour of death, mm. it shows what they live for. Amen. Yes. And mm -hmm. there's not that many people 
today that can give that testimony. Amen. But I am thankful. I'm thankful for the, the recollection of that and also for the provocation of that. To live in such a way that even in death, you're still fervent to accomplish what you lived for. Amen. Let me ask you a question, Sister Barbara. Didn't it do something for you personally when someone like this, you heard them speak, it did, it had an, it has an effect mm -hmm. on your heart. Only those that have experienced it know what we're talking about, but mm -hmm. that kind of testimony has a powerful impact. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, Brother Judah. You know, that's what, <clears throat> what Jacob said here. So that father is sick, then Joseph came and he said, God appeared unto me. Yeah. He didn't mm -hmm. say, I wrestled with an angel and he threw my hip out of joint, and I still haven't quite gotten over that. He said, the <laughs> Lord appeared unto me. That's right. What is man that thou That's art mindful right. of him, and the son of man that thou hast visited him? Yes. When Jacob saw God, God appeared unto him. That's the point where everything changed. Amen. And that's what he remembered, and that's what made it to this talk with Joseph here, and then Ephraim and the Manasseh shall be mine, and the uh, issue is it's after them, but he saw God. The Lord mm -hmm. appeared unto me. That's what he remembered Amen. most. Amen. That's good thinking. Yeah. Brother Jason. Yeah, it's interesting that Jacob brings up Rachel again. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I, I think there's there's got to be more to that than just Jacob's love for Rachel. I, I think that's part of it. Um, but th it's interesting that this, this whole thing about Rachel's death is mentioned in a couple of other places yeah. in, in some interesting places in the scriptures one place is Jeremiah 31 <laughs> and it's that verse it says a voice is heard in Ramah lamentation and bitter weeping Rachel is weeping for her children That's right. <laughs> she refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more yeah. It's that's quoted again in Matthew yeah. after the wise men leave and yeah. Herod murders all the babies yeah. in Bethlehem. Yeah. Matthew says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, a voice is heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. Now my own thought is is that this whole thing about Rachel she died in childbirth. That's right. She died giving birth. As part of this promise. That's right. <laughs> he That's got the only one who died. died. Give a birth. This, is, this is a picture of how the kingdom of God is going to be established. That's right. That's it's going right. to be a. It's going to be established through pain, yep. death, tribulation, like labor pain. That's she right. died in labor. That's through, right. Bringing forth this life. See. That's a picture of Christ. Jesus died right. to give us birth. That's right. The kingdom of God is going to be established through tribulation, pain, suffering. But on the other end of it is life. Life. Mm -hmm. And we die. Mm -hmm. When yeah. we're born again, we die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Yeah, Brother Jim. Sister When you said towards the beginning, um, what can um, we learn? What can we um, learn from the life of Jacob? Those you said those who um, those who are called and are used by God are not um, summoned to a to a trouble free a trouble free life of ease and comfort. And another time, you also mentioned. Comfort is a good. <clears throat> comfort is good, and uh, inconvenience can be bad. However, comfort isn't always the best thing, and in inconvenience isn't always the best thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't worst always thing. the worst thing. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I I thought this first Jesus had um, Jesus had quote, um, spoke. He said, "Enter ye." Enter ye at the straight gate, for the wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth into destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, 7 13 through 14. I thought, mm -hmm. the reason this is, is because if you have if you have no trials or tribulation, it 
um, you will never grow stronger nor eat nor know whether you're still on the track or not. So these trials are things that the Lord brings you through. They're actually a blessing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good thoughts. Good to see me. All right. Our right, Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the patriarch, or Jacob. And we pray, Lord, that we'll follow in his train, train of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, be noted for our faith, noted for being strangers and pilgrims, noted for obeying, noted for believing. We thank you that we're living in a day of greater light. And we pledge ourselves to take advantage of this by giving more diligence and being dependable. We ask for grace to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.